Okay, I think we can uh, start. It's five o'clock, and uh, happy Mardi Gras to everybody, first of all. Um, so uh, today, uh, I want to welcome everybody to the, uh, my name is actually Elena Volpi, and I'm the director of City Center on Aging. And I want to welcome to the third lecture of the 21st annual Lefevre Winter Series on Aging, uh, which is a series of six lectures. Um, they're held here in the winter. Um, and uh, our lecture is open to all the community here in Galveston. So that's a nice part of it. Um, the lecture series is uh, in memory of Dr. Edward James Lefevre, uh, who was a Galveston physician who had a passion for geriatrics and actually developed and, 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 um, and uh, grew uh, geriatric medicine on the island. Today, I have the, uh, the pleasure to introduce uh, one of the major national leaders in uh, research and education in geriatrics. It's Dr. Thomas Gill, and is also a friend and a collaborator. Um, Dr. Gill is the Humana Foundation Professor of Geriatric Medicine, the Director of the Program on Aging, and the Director of the Pepper Center and of the Center for Disability and Disabling Disorders at Yale University Medical School. Dr. Gill obtained a bachelor, his bachelor's degree in computer science and chemistry from Loyola University in Chicago and a medical degree from University of Chicago. And after a medical degree, he went for a residency at the uh, University of Washington, where he climbed up to become the chief resident. And after that, uh, he went to uh, Yale to do uh, postdoctoral uh, training in geriatrics and epidemiology, and remained at Yale uh, over the years in the faculty, and has climbed up uh, up to the current position of professor, full professor and director of several centers. Um, Dr. Gill's research seeks to understand the mechanisms underlying functional decline and disability in older people, and uh, to develop also preventive strategies uh, to prevent that uh, and to uh, maintain independence in older adults. His research has been continuously funded by the NIH and uh, other agencies for more than 20 years. Um, among the most notable grants that he's led as a principal investigator is uh, an NIH Merit Award, um, the NIA-funded Pepper Center, of which we have one here too, um, and the uh, STRIDE study, which is one of the PIs. Uh, actually, the STRIDE study is a brand new, um, first in its kind, a pragmatic clinical trial looking at uh, trying to prevent falls in, the, in older people and seniors in the community and prevent injury from falls. Um, it is funded by PCORI, and, uh, and we actually have one site here at UTMB, and so it is possible that some of you might have seen some mail outs coming from the STRIDE study. Uh, either as a direct uh, um, addressee or as a, you, you've seen mail outs coming to someone close to you or to one of your patients. And um, so I would like to encourage you to support the study. Um, the, uh, so the, the, the Dr. Gill has also published over 200 papers um, on the research that's done over the years in very high impact journals. And I received a number of awards and honors for all of the activities that is um, done and all his uh, accomplishments. Among these awards, there's a Paul Beeson Faculty Scholar Award from the uh, American Federation for Aging Research, the Outstanding Scientific Achievement for Clinical uh, Investigation Award, uh, and Outstanding Research Committee Service Award, both from the American Geriatric Society. And it, just this past year, he's received the um, Joseph, Joseph Freeman Award from the Gerontological Society of America. It's really a, a big award. He's participated in many national committees and study sections and has chaired also several NIH study sections. So please join me to welcome Dr. Tom Gill, who's going to talk about <laughs> end of life. Thank you, Helena, for those kind words. Um, I was actually here for the seventh series uh, 14 years ago. Uh, so 
This is a redo. Uh, for those who have uh, been around for a while, um, you may see some common themes, but I can guarantee you the only thing that is old in this presentation is my sports coat, which I think I wore 14 years ago. I'm embarrassed to say. Um, so, here's the subject matter today. What's really happening at the end of life? Insights from the Yale PEP study. Um, I'm going to focus uh, it's kind of two segments, one on functional outcomes and the other on symptoms. And I'm going to start uh, with function. Um, and James Fries at Stanford many years ago, in 1980, um, had postulated this new hypothesis on compression and morbidity in which if the onset of disability could be postponed to a greater extent, then life expectancy, expectancy would increase. Lifetime disability could be compressed into shorter average period prior to death. And that's often our objective, is to keep folks as functional as possible and perhaps pass in their sleep uh, after running a marathon or something along those lines. Uh, so, and there's actually some data to support uh, that hypothesis. Um, and these are data from the National Long-Term Care Survey there are old data now, and there's a new cohort study that's replaced this called NHATS, uh, but they don't quite have sufficient follow-up to make some of the important observations. But this dotted line shows the rates of chronic disability in Americans over age 65. And back in the early 1982, the rates of about one out of every four persons had chronic disability. Uh, meaning that they require personal assistance with an important functional task for up to 90 days uh, in any one year. But that line has been, has been decreasing over the course of more than 20 years, reaching you know, about 21% in 2004. And yet the absolute number of older Americans with chronic disability would continue to increase uh, into the mid-1990s largely because this population was expanding in size. Uh, so the absolute number of persons were increasing. But because the decline in the rate of disability was so pronounced uh, in these latter 10 years, the absolute number of older Americans with chronic disability was actually decreasing. And this is really one of the major accomplishments, uh, whether it's you know, for medical care or public health or a combination of the, of the two. Um, the question, though, is, you know, those are data at the population level. You know, how relevant is it for any one individual or for a doctor or a nurse caring for a patient? You know, patients, families, and physicians may be more interested in knowing the likelihood and course of disability at the end of life. Uh, and prior research has shown that the majority of older persons are disabled in the last year of life. Uh, but much less is known about functional trajectories at the end of life. So I'm going to walk you through some uh, of the results you know, from our own work. Uh, after I've had a chance to you know, summarize work that had preceded ours, and this is actually data from the EPI study, not the Hispanic EPIs, but the, the, the precursor at the three prior EPI sites, published uh, more than 10 years ago. And they had uh, data that collected in annual waves. And what they did is they took advantage that of people when they died. And if they died one month before their annual interview, they're represented here. If they died 12 months before their annual interview, they're at the 12 month mark. So they tried to simulate uh, a traditional longitudinal perspective <coughs> study. Um, and what they found was they had four different modes of death, sudden death, cancer, organ failure, and frailty. And they found that the, uh, the course of disability was, was worse 
in, in the frailty group, uh, intermediate in the organ failure. Cancer folks had this kind of terminal decline, and, and the others that were classified as sudden death had fairly uh, stable function at reasonably high levels uh, until they had died. Um, and the supposition was that there's, these are fairly homogeneous, that if you have cancer, you're going to follow this pathway, and if you have frailty, you're going to follow this pathway. And it just didn't seem to jive with my own clinical experience as a geriatrician. I thought, you know, there seems to be a lot more heterogeneity out there than this work would have suggested. Uh, so, you know, we questioned the validity of those results. Uh, as I mentioned, participants were not prospectively followed during their last year of life. Disability profiles were simulated after decedents were subdivided into these 12 different cohorts based on the number of months between their annual interview in which function was assessed and when they died. And you might suspect that folks who are in the last few months of life may be less likely to uh, participate in, in an annual interview or survey. Um, the frailty group, uh, and this was kind of pre-Linda Freed, uh, was defined rather crudely uh, on the basis of any nursing home admission during the entire follow-up period. And we know a lot of patients um, transition from the hospital to the nursing home before they end up uh, back home, perhaps because they need rehab, and we wouldn't necessarily consider them frail, particularly if that admission was several years before. Uh, dementia was not included as a mode of death, and we know as folks grow older that becomes an increasingly common problem, and, uh, and a fairly sizable proportion of older persons will die from dementia, in addition to dying with dementia. Uh, and the sudden death group was unusually large. Um, and the age of death was somewhere in the 80s, and yet they represented about a quarter of the population. Again, it didn't seem to jive with our clinical experience. Um, so our objectives uh, were to identify clinically distinct trajectories of disability in the last year of life, uh, and second, to determine whether and how the distribution of those trajectories differ according to the mode of death. And we hypothesized that for each mode of death, and by mode of death, it's kind of analogous to cause of death, um, like cancer could be a mode of death. Uh, we postulated that there would be considerable heterogeneity. It's not a one-size-fits-all proposition. <clears throat> and we have the good fortune of uh, having data from the Precipitating Events Project, um, and this is a rather unique longitudinal study um, in which we've been following a cohort of 754 persons. They were initially non-disabled, all living in the community. They were 70 years and older. Uh, we uh, had a relatively modest budget to get this study off the ground, and we partnered with what had been a large healthcare plan in the greater New Haven area, uh, and they were in the process of disbanding. But they provided us with a list, and this is pre-HIPAA, they provided us a list of their uh, 32, 3,400 persons who were all 70 and older. And that was our sampling frame. Uh, and we enrolled the 754 persons over about an 18 month period in the late 90s, and we had a fairly respectable participation rate of 75%. Um, and we try to minimize exclusion criteria. We're interested in the, uh, the mechanisms underlying the development uh, of disability. And so we, uh, we uh, excluded persons who were already disabled, meaning they required personal assistance in one or more of four key ADLs, bathing, dressing, walking, or transferring. If they had a diagnosis of, of a terminal illness with a life expectancy less than a year, uh, and if they were planning to move out of New Haven during the next uh, year, uh, or if they had sig significant cognitive impairment with no available proxy. We didn't want to exclude persons who had cognitive impairment because we knew that that was going to be an important uh, risk factor for developing disability. At the same time, a lot of our study was based on, had to rely on reported information from the participant. And if they were impaired, those data may not be accurate or reliable. 
Uh, but we excluded only a very small proportion of persons for this reason. So this is what the cohort looked like in the late 90s. Um, you know, almost 80 on average, two-thirds women. Uh, this is a little different than the demographics, uh, perhaps in the Southwest. Uh, we only had about 10 uh, percent who were non-Caucasian. Um, about 40 percent lived alone. Uh, edu about a high school education, on average, two or more chronic conditions. Uh, physical frailty, we oversampled persons who are physically frail, and that was on the basis of flow gait speed. Jim would like that, given his uh, prior writings on, on, on flow gait speed. Um, and cognitive impairment, we had about 11%. And that was defined on the basis of a full speed mini mental state exam score of less than 24. Uh, the analytics, now the unique aspect of this study I thought I had a slide to mention is that we've been interviewing these participants every month now for the past 18 years. Um, and uh, the completion rate for those interviews has been 99%. Um, and we've only lost over that 18 year period about 5% of our sample for reasons other than death. So we have fairly complete data. Um, and in fact, they are. I mean, this is back in 2008 when we finished the analysis or started the analysis for this study. There were 405 decedents, and we're focusing on the last year of life. So we're studying decedents. Uh, only about 4% had dropped out of the study at that time, and you know, a small number didn't have information on the mode of death. Um, and so we studied 383 decedents for this analysis. Uh, and here's actually the slide that talks about data collection. Every 18 months, we go out to the home and do a comprehensive assessment. Uh, completion rates are somewhere in the mid-90s there. Um, the, here are the monthly interviews. Again, completion rate 99%. We focus on these four ADLs. They're the kind of the big four, uh, the basic self-care ADLs. Uh, we ascertain deaths by review of local obituaries. Uh, or from an informant during a subsequent telephone interview. Uh, cause of death was noted, was coded by a nephrologist um, in a fairly standard manner um, using information for death certificates. Uh, here's how we classify mode of death. Now, cause of death is what's on the death certificate, and we use that information in part to uh, classify mode of death. Uh, so, cancer determined from death certificate with a you know, variety of these codes. Advanced dementia, which often is under-reported on death certificates. We did not rely on that alone. We also used data from our cognitive assessments that we completed in the home. Um, and they had to have an MMC score of 10 or less. Uh, organ failure was based on death certificates for heart failure, for chronic obstructive lung disease, for chronic kidney disease, or cirrhosis. Uh, frailty was based on home assessments uh, using the, the free criteria, uh, weight loss, exhaustion, low physical activity, muscle weakness, or low speed. walking speed. We had data on all five of those elements uh, every 18 months. Uh, sudden death was an ex you know, based on the exclusion of any of these, based on data, death certificate, home assessments, monthly interviews. So they couldn't meet criteria for cancer, advanced dementia, organ failure, or frailty. They could report none of those conditions uh, on any of the surveys uh, during every 18 months, and they could not be living in a nursing home at the time of death. And we had another category that didn't meet any of these. So, and we created a hierarchy, and this is similar to what Lunny had done. Uh, so if someone had cancer, uh, that trumped everything else, so they were classified cancer, next in line was advanced dementia, organ failure, and frailty. So they had, they could have been frail and also had had cancer and they'll be classified as cancer. We did the analysis, not restricted to this hierarchy and the results are very comparable. Um, I have the good fortune of working with very strong biostatisticians who uh, introduced me to this, uh, at the time, relatively novel, 
uh, statistical uh, program called Proctrage, which will uh, generate uh, trajectories um, that are, are distinct based on the data, and we assign seasons to specific trajectories based on maximum estimated probability of memberships, and this is some statistical language here, which probabilities is 0.9 is considered excellent, anything less than 0.7 is considered poor, um, and we did then we determine the distribution of the functional trajectories for each mode of death, and that will become clear when I present the results. So this slide is one of the two key slides in this uh, analysis, and it shows the trajectories of disability in the last year of life among 383 uh, decedents, and there were five trajectories. There were a group here in yellow or gold that, and this is and in this axis is the severity of disability. There are four ADLs, so this is zero, meaning essentially non-disabled, and four, which is the most severe levels of disability. Uh, so there's a group here, quite sizable, 65 out of the 383 that had no disability uh, throughout the last year. The solid lines are uh, what we observed, and the, the uh, dotted lines here, the dashed lines, are what's the model, the statistical model would have predicted. And you can see that for many of these trajectories, the lines overlap, meaning that the fit was very good. Uh, we have another group, the second group, what we call catastrophic disability, a little larger, but they look very similar to the no disability group until about three months prior to death and then uh, they were hit by a thunderbolt. Uh, and they achieved very high levels of, of disability, a little over three, which would be classified by severe. Uh, another group here started non-disabled uh, at 12 months prior to death, but started increasing disability about nine to 10 months out, and then became increasingly disabled and ended up in the same spot uh, as catastrophic. Uh, Another group here, 91 participants, had relatively mild levels of disability a year before death, and then became progressively more disabled. Interested in all three of these groups, ended up about the same point in the month before death. And then you had the last group here that we call persistently severe disability, uh, 84, which is about 20%, more than 20%. They were severely disabled at the outset, 12 months prior to death, and they remain so, and there's kind of a ceiling effect here. They couldn't, by this measure, become any more disabled. Uh, and this slide just summarizes the statistical fit, uh, demonstrating that for each of the trajectories, they're over, they're 0.9 or above, anything above 0.9 is considered excellent. And a very small proportion of folks had fits that were less than 0.7. I think there were 34 overall in the sample of 384, so about 7 or 8%. But the model that can fit the data quite nicely. Um, and this slide just shows demographically what folks look like, and I'm going to start uh, here overall. Uh, the 383, uh, about 84.4 years on average. Uh, at the, I think the, the year before they died, 60% women, and, uh, mature, great, vast majority Caucasian, high school education, uh, about two and a half chronic conditions. Um, and then show you how these same characteristics differ uh, across the different modes of death. Here's just the frequencies. You've seen that the most common. Uh, mode of death was progressive, followed by persistently severe, followed by catastrophic, accelerated, and no disability. But comparably sized groups overall. Uh, in terms of mean age, uh, the oldest segment were those who had persistently severe disability, almost 87. Uh, the youngest were those who had catastrophic or, or no disability. Women preferentially were in progressive and persistently severe, and that's uh, I think consistent with what we observe and other studies have shown is that women are more likely to live with higher levels of disability uh, before.
before they die. Um, things didn't change that much by, by race and education. Uh, was higher level to those who had no disability or catastrophic uh, and lower uh, here. Um, education was very comparable except our number of chronic conditions was comparable except for those who had no disability had fewer chronic conditions and that makes sense. This is a comparable slide, but now we're looking at the modes of death. Um, and overall, you see the most common cause of death, mode of death, was uh, frailty, about 28%, um, followed by organ failure, followed by cancer, followed by this other group. Uh, followed by advanced dementia, and then sudden. So only about 3% of our sample had sudden death, as opposed to money study, which is about a quarter. Uh, and I think that's because we have advanced dementia, we have an expanded organ definition that included chronic kidney disease and cirrhosis, uh, and we have, I think, a better indicator for frailty uh, than they use. Um, and here, across mean age, uh, you can see the advanced dementia was the oldest group here. Um, similarly, there are more likely to be women. Um, and not much racial differences except here. And all none of the sudden deaths were minorities, but the, the numbers are, are small. Um, more highly educated folks had sudden death. Um, and not surprisingly, they have the fewest chronic conditions. So that just sets the table for the next slide, which is probably the second most important slide in this analysis, which is now looking within modes of death for how common these trajectories are. Remember in the prior study by Money, they assumed that for each mode of death, it was one size fits all. Now, with the exception of dimension, advanced dementia, that's the only trajectory in which there was really a predominant trajectory. And this is the se per persistently severe disability group. So that line at the top that you saw consists in large part of persons who had advanced dementia. And they were represented in very small proportions in the other trajectories. Uh, now sudden death, uh, about 50%. And we're in that bottom line. And that makes sense as well. Um, and then this next line was catastrophic. And, and then they had small representation in uh, accelerated and in, uh, I think, persistently severe. But otherwise, things were fairly heterogeneous as we had uh, thought when you look at frailty as a mode of death. About 14% were in that bottom line of no disability. Uh, about a quarter were at that top line at severe disability. But they had pretty good representation uh, in those other three trajectories. And that's fairly similar to what organ failure as well. So again, these data, and even for cancer, um, uh, one out of five had no disability in their last year of life. Um, about one out of three had that accelerated or that you know, hit by a thunderbolt uh, and the smaller components here and then very few were in that top line of persistence. So clearly not a one size fits all. Uh, and so to summarize, in the last year of life, five clinically distinct trajectories of disability were identified. The distribution of these trajectories was quite varied for several different modes of death. The least heterogeneous genius mode of death was advanced dementia, which was characterized by high levels of disability for that entire year. Uh, and for the other modes of death, between about 27% to 80% were non-disabled or had very low levels of disability until just a few months prior to their death. So for most decedents, the course of disability at the end of life does not follow a predictable pattern based on the mode of death. And that makes things, I think, challenging, not just for patients and families, but also physicians who are supposed to be inviting them uh, because of this 
heterogeneity. And it led us to try to think, well, what's, what's making things so heterogeneous? What's, what's underlying rational um, mechanism? Uh, and I'll get to that momentarily. But in terms of patients, this heterogeneity and functional trajectory suggests that the personal care needs at the end of life cannot be easily predicted for most older persons. You can't say, why well, I have cancer. And I'm likely to die from that cancer. It's not easy to determine what course someone's going to be on in terms of their function. And for many older persons, for their families, that's one of the most important considerations in their last age of life. They want to maintain the highest level of independence if possible. Uh, and our findings, I think, raise concerns about policies that establish benefits for end of life care based primarily on disease specific criteria. Uh, and we know that hospice is largely based on disease specific criteria. And the care needs of many persons uh, who do not have predictable courses can be quite substantial, and yet they may not meet disease specific criteria for hospice, and so do not benefit. Um, so, we're interested in the mechanisms, and we hypothesize based on some prior work that I'll, I'll summarize briefly that disability trajectories at the end of life are driven, at least in part, by acute hospitalizations. Acute illnesses and injuries lead to hospitalization. Uh, and that can be due in part to the deleterious effects of the presenting illness or injury but also the known hazards of what can happen in the hospital. Um, and we had done some prior work with the same cohort trying to identify factors that lead to new disability. Someone who goes from independent to requiring personal assistance and one or more of those four ADLs from one month to the next. And you can see in this part of the slide all the usual suspects. So every five years older you are, you have a 34% increase in the likelihood of becoming disabled from one month to the next. Um, and if you have cognitive impairment, you're about a 30% increase in the risk of becoming disabled. If you have depressive symptoms, it's a little more than 30% increased risk. Uh, and the greatest risk factor, the strongest risk factor, is physical frailty, smoking speed. If you're physically frail, you have a twofold uh, increase in your risk of becoming disabled from one month to the next. And that's, these are consistent with other studies. We pretty much just looked at these uh, factors that are measured at one point in time and then following the optimum layer. Now, when we were interested in a physician, I say, well, what I observe is that folks become disabled when they get sick. Well, something bad happens to them. Uh, and so we've been uh, asking every month when we interview our participants whether they've been in the hospital. Uh, and we, if they're not in the hospital, we also ask them whether they had uh, restricted activity, meaning in the past month that they have cut down on their usual activities, uh, or have they had to stay in bed for at least half of the day because of an illness, injury, or other problem. Uh, and then we looked at the association between hospitalization and these episodes of restricted activity and new disability. And here we are, hazard ratio of almost 60, meaning that you have a 60-fold increase in your risk of developing new disability if you're hospitalized. So that's 30-fold over the next contender, which is physical threat. Uh, and if you have some other illness or injury that doesn't lead to hospitalization, but causes you to take the bed for at least half of a day, or to cut down on some other usual activity, you have a five-fold increase in your risk of developing disability. Uh, so this is really where the action's at. Uh, not so, these are factors that may make you more vulnerable, but this is what's really driving uh, disability. And then we looked at uh, something a little more complex, these transitions. So what we learned is that persons become disabled, the vast majority will go on and recover uh, over the next several months. And so we were interested in these transitions from going from no disability to mild disability, which is one or two of those ADLs, uh, 
or they can go to severe disability, meaning three or four of those ADLs. Um, they can go back to no disability from severe, or they can go back to no disability from mild. They can go back and forth from these two states. Unfortunately, all roads lead to Rome. Uh, so there's only a one-way transition. Um, and the, I mean, at least in our study, it may be in Galveston, they can operate a little bit. Uh, so these are all the same hazard ratios, the same type of metric that I showed you in the last slide. So, uh, and this is the effect of hospitalization. I'm not going to show restricted activity, just hospitalization. Uh, you can so go from no disability to severe disability. A hospitalization will increase the likelihood of that 168 fold. Uh, and to go from no disability to mild, about nine fold elevation. Uh, to go from mild to severe increases the likelihood of about eight fold. Uh, and it also works in the other direction. If you have severe disability, this is the only one in which it's not statistically, statistically significant. Uh, going from severe disability, you're less likely to recover if you are hospitalized. And that's what this point seven is. Uh, if you're in mild disability, you're less likely to recover if you're hospitalized. It's point four. I mean, it lowers the likelihood. Uh, and we already know that hospitalization is strongly associated with that, uh, you know, from any of these points. Um, so we had evidence that hospitalizations are really driving the disabling process based on these earlier results. So it made us think, well, maybe they're also driving those trajectories that I mentioned earlier. And this slide kind of summarizes broadly you know, what's going on with hospitalizations. And I know this is a, an area of great interest at the Pepper Center uh, here at UPMB. Uh, and it actually has Ken Kavinsky at UCSF coined this term hospitalization associated with disability. Uh, and so there are some factors that make, make one vulnerable for becoming disabled in the setting of an acute illness. Then there's the acute illness itself. And here are some of the bad things that can happen to you in the hospital. You're put to bed, you're not fed, uh, you know, you're, you're getting a lot of medications. Uh, and there's, in many hospitals, there's not this culture focusing on independence. So you can be a very, you know, very dependent state in a hospital. Uh, so for all those reasons, you have folks who you know, will lose their independence and uh, develop disability in the setting of acute illness or injury leading to hospitalization. Uh, so for the second analysis, our sample was larger because we used data through the middle of 2013. You know, about 580 of our participants had died. Um, less than 5% had dropped out of the study before that point, so we were analyzing about 550 decedents. Uh, this is a very similar slide to the one I showed you before. Uh, with, you know, this line is about the same, the line on the bottom is about the same, here's the catastrophic, uh, here's the accelerated, uh, here's the progressively severe. Now we had one additional line, we had six trajectories here, uh, and it's what we call the Aggressively mild disability, and that's what the model had generated. Uh, now, this is a means to an end. We really wanted to see the effect of hospitalizations in you know, causing, distinguishing these trajectories. Um, so, this slide summarizes the hospitalization experience in the last year of life. Uh, so, here's the number of hospitalizations on this axis, here's the percent. Uh, and here are the different trajectories. This is the no disability group here, and the persistently severe disability group here. Um, and the, the, the trajectory that had the most hospitalizations was the blue, the accelerated. Uh, this gives you a, a visual flavor of the distribution of the trajectories. And there's considerable differences. You can see the uh, much less common to be hospitalized in the no disability group. Uh, and very few had more than one hospitalization, uh, and uh, that was different for each of these trajectories. Um, about 71% had at least one hospitalization in the last year of life, almost a half had two or more hospitalizations in the last year of life. Um, this slide just shows you, and I'll just summarize briefly, the reason for those hospitalizations. Uh, and 
the majority of we look at we have cardiac infection, fall related injury, stroke, arthritis, cancer, GI bleeding. You can just get a sense of whether you know that makes sense based on your own clinical experience. Uh, the largest category is actually other medical here. Um, and otherwise, cardiac is fairly common. Uh, infection, uh, fall-related fractures, um, only up to about 5%. Uh, there wasn't great differences uh, across the different trajectories. Uh, again, this is probably the most important slide uh, for this analysis. So what we did was we mapped the trajectories versus the prevalence of a hospitalization each month. So, and let me get this right. So, on this axis, you see prevalence of hospital admissions, and on this axis, the severity of disability. Uh, so, the trajectories are here in red, and the hospital results are in blue. Uh, so, the easiest one might be looking at the catastrophic. The lines are almost superimposed. So, you know, the non disabled, and then boom. Hospitalization rate, hospitalization rate goes up considerably, and disability goes up. Um, and you can see from the no disability group, the lines are fairly parallel, and that's what you would expect if our hypothesis was true. Um, very similar for the accelerated disability, the lines are, are again superimposed until you know, just within the last two months of life when hospitalization is kind of. Uh, flatten out and disability continues to increase. Um, here, similar patterns, they're not superimposed, but they're going in the same upwards traject, uh, uh, direction. And here, uh, you know, the persistently severe disability group didn't have very high rates of hospitalization overall, and they vary from probably about 5% to about 20%. And again, their function couldn't get any worse because they were already disabled 12 months out. Uh, so graphically, these results would suggest that hospitalization playing a significant role uh, in distinguishing these trajectories. Uh, and so then we go to more uh, traditional statistical analysis um, with multivariate models, and we are looking at longitudinally the association between the hospitalization and each of these trajectories. Um, and let me just point out here first, the catastrophic disability, each hospitalization increased the relative of the rate ratio of being a catastrophic disability twofold. And it increased, oh no, this increased the disability. No, among those who had catastrophic disability, uh, a hospitalization increased the likelihood of increasing disability twofold. And on an absolute basis, a hospitalization led to a two point increase. Again, we're already on a four-point scale. Um, and the rate, rate ratio is pretty high for no disability, but that's relative to having very low levels of disability. You can see in absolute terms, when they were hospitalized, it didn't have much effect on their disability. Uh, so each of these values were statistically significant. So the models support what we saw graphically, that there's a strong association between being hospitalized and being on one of these trajectories. So to summarize, in the last year of life, the occurrence of acute illness and injury leading hospitalization is strongly associated with the course of disability for six distinct trajectories. And we, based on these results, think that the knowledge about the course of disability prior to these intervening events may facilitate clinical decision making. You might decide whether hospitalization is appropriate, you might put more resources in preventing hospitalizations, um, depending on what trajectory someone's on. Uh, so here's, I think, spelled out more grandly. Aggressive efforts are warranted to minimize the adverse functional consequences of acute hospitalizations. Focus on restorative interventions, uh, whether it's in the acute, subacute setting, home care setting, or outpatient setting. Uh, and I know that that's a major area of interest here as well about recovery. Uh, Reduce the likelihood of subsequent admissions after an index admission uh, and to prevent that index uh, hospitalization. Um, and then it does raise uh, the profile perhaps of palliative care, uh, which might be 
uh, something to consider to address the shared needs, at least among subsets of these individuals, perhaps those with progressive or persistently severe levels of severe disability, who represent about half the decedents, uh, and perhaps also those who are on an accelerated course or that catastrophic group. Uh, they may benefit from palliative care. Uh, so that's kind of the function side of the equation, and patients tell us time and time again that function is important, but symptoms are also of great interest and importance to them. Um, and it's the freedom from these symptoms, consistently identified by seriously ill persons, their family members, and clinicians as an important determinant of good health. And we really don't know much about symptoms at the end, end of life, other than for disease-specific conditions, particularly cancer. Uh, but not so much for other conditions. Um, so for this analysis, again, the same half cohort to decedents, uh, analysis that were completed in mid-2011, about 511 decedents. Um, 20 had dropped out of the study at that point, so 491 are included in this analysis. Um, I alluded to this earlier. Uh, we were focusing on what we call restricting symptoms, meaning that persons had to in indicate during one of those monthly interviews that they had to stay, that they stayed in bed for at least a half a day because of an illness or an injury or other problem, or they cut down on one's usual activities because of an illness, injury, or other problem. They're standard questions. Uh, and if they said yes to either of those questions, they were then asked a series of questions about symptoms. And we're focusing here on 15 <coughs> physical and psychological symptoms. Uh, and if they said that they had shortness of breath, for example, we then asked them, is that what caused you to cut down on your usual activities for the same benefit? So all the symptom data I'm showing you uh, require restrictions in their activity. So it raises the bar. It's not a sniffle. It's something meaningful, clinical. Um, and Shriva Chaudhary in our group uh, led this uh, project. And this is the overall uh, prevalence of restricted act restricting symptoms in the last year of life. You can see you know, a fairly stable for the first, you know, about you know, from month 12 prior to death to about month six or seven prior to death, about one out of five persons. Uh, but thereafter, the rate started increasing. And so in the last two or three months of life, restricting symptoms approached 50%. In the last month of life, about 60%. Um, and this panel here just shows you that those findings, this is, uh, across all the 15 symptoms. These are for each of the individual symptoms. Uh, you can see we have fatigue, dizziness or unsteadiness, memory or thinking problems, one leg and feet or ankle, cold or flu symptoms, pain, shortness of breath, depression, anxiety, poor eyesight, uh, chest pain, problems with sleep, urinary problems, abdominal problems. But the same general pattern with fatigue being the symptom that increase more precipitously uh, at the end of life. But each of them more common in the last, you know, last phase here. Um, and it, it, these symptoms didn't differ that much across those same mode of death conditions, um, with the exception of sudden death. And as you would expect, those who died suddenly had lower monthly occurrence of restricting symptoms. But otherwise, all these lines pretty much overlap. Cancer, dementia, frailty, organ failure. Um, so they don't map too tightly on the mode of death. Um, and you can't, and this is problematic because a lot of our attention at the end of life is focusing on, quote, terminal conditions such as cancer. Um, and then we just looked at what factors increased the likelihood of having restricting symptoms in the last year of life. Uh, the younger age, those who were younger than 85, um, had you know, an odds ratio of being a 30% increase in their odds uh, of having restricting symptoms. Um, otherwise, they had more chronic conditions, and that's not surprising. About almost 40% increase in the odds ratio. Uh, the closer they got to death, 
that was uh, significantly associated. Uh, and but not so much in the condition fleet with that a little more likely in those who had cancer relative to sudden death. But they're all in a relatively narrow range. Uh, so to summarize, restricting symptoms are common at the end of life with notable increases beginning in at least in the last five months prior to death. Factors associated with symptom occurrence include younger age in this older population, multimorbidity at least two or more chronic conditions, uh, as death approaches, the symptoms become more common, and then deaths and cancer. Implications, um, we argue that we need to do a better job of integrating symptom assessment and management into routine care of older persons with serious illness, particularly those who have multiple chronic conditions. It need not be disease specific. Um, now, we've linked our data to claims data from CMS, and this provided us with an opportunity to address this question. Does admission to hospice alter the natural history of restricting symptoms we would hope so. I mean, that's what hospice is designed to do, it is to uh, reduce the burden of symptoms at the end of life. There's actually not a lot of evidence to support that. The evidence that does exist focuses almost exclusively on cancer. So uh, we, I, through 2013, we identified about 260 of our participants who had a hospice admission uh, using Medicare claims and then confirming that through review of medical records. Uh, about 5% dropped out of the study, so they're not included. Uh, in fact, we had one participant who died before we could even interview them the first month after they enrolled. <laughs> uh, so they're not included. Uh, and then a, a very small proportion of folks had incomplete data on restricting their symptoms in the last few months. So, I'm going to be reporting about 241 participants who were admitted to hospice. Um, and here are the uh, hospice admission diagnoses. Uh, not surprisingly, cancer is the most common, about 30 or more than 30 percent, followed by neurodegenerative diseases, primarily dementia, but it could be Parkinson's as well. Uh, cardiovascular, including heart disease, stroke aneurysm, aortic dissections, other organ failure, pulmonary disease, um, some other respiratory abnormality. These are all based on ICD-9 designation from the CMS data, uh, gastrointestinal liver disease, renal disease, uh, and then frailty or debility, which had, until recently, has been um, a legitimate uh, diagnosis or reason for admission to hospice. CMS has changed that within the last few years. Um, so they represent the small segment, about 10 percent. A fairly, you know, good distribution of the different causes uh, of death. In this case, reason for hospice admission. Um, so these results are in press at the American Journal of Medicine, and uh, was led by a medical student uh, who, the summer before he started medical school, Yale had a new program to try to get new students interested in the search. Uh, and so before he took his first medical class, he started working with me on this project and pretty much did all the analysis himself. Uh, and this is a similar slide to before with the prevalence of restricting symptoms here. And you can see fairly, you know, maybe increasing, you know, flat for the first half or six months in the year before death, and then increasing, increasing, increasing the starting line is when hospice started. And then uh, the greatest level immediately after uh, enrollment in hospice, and then decline. Uh, and then here's the mean number of restricting symptoms. So we have about 15 symptoms, but we just counted them up. And this is very similar result, pattern of results here. A slap, starting to increase, uh, reaching fairly high levels, maxing out. Uh, before the first monthly interview, or the first monthly interview, the monthly interview asked about since we last talked in the past month. So it's asking about the prior month. And 
I'll show you another slide that the monthly interviews are just happening every month, regardless of when someone is hospitalized, regardless of when they're uh, But again, this would provide at least indirect evidence that hospice uh, is doing something. I mean, it's reducing the likelihood of having restricting symptoms, and it's reducing the burden of restricting symptoms. Uh, this is what I was referring to earlier. Uh, this uh, broken down to days after the hospice admission. You know, they have their monthly interview within the first 10 days, within the next 10 days, or beyond the, the first 20 days. And this is relevant because we're asking about the last month, and we were thinking that the, the symptoms would be highest before hospice. And that's what we're seeing here. So in the first 10 days after hospice, what we're asking is that really, really referring more so before hospice than after hospice. You can see the prevalence is highest and then lower and lower. Uh, again, it's providing some evidence that hospice is beneficial. You see similar results here in the mean number of restrictions. Um, and this slide just is very similar, it's very busy, but it just shows you the individual. Uh, we, we, we ran the analysis looking at the different modes of death or different reasons for hospice. And they were fairly comparable findings going up, 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 go to hospice, symptoms come down. Uh, men and women act very similarly. This is for just the prevalence of hospice, and this is the mean number of symptoms. Um, and you can see here, this is uh, based on a very small number of persons. I think there were only five persons who had organ failure that were still alive in three months. Now, the challenge for this type of study is that high competing risk of death. And so the numbers you can see go down considerably. We're about 230, 240, and then a month after the hospice, uh, of 111, uh, and then 50 at three months. The average length of stay in hospice is only two weeks. And uh, that's consistent with, you know, we're often thinking too late. Hospice is a benefit for the last six months of life. And yet, folks are in the world in hospice and so they're almost on, on death's door. And that's unfortunate because you can see there's some value here, at least from the symptoms. Um, and we divided uh, symptoms into three groups, thinking that you know there are some symptoms that are more amenable to hospice or palliative care than other symptoms, uh, and this is what we consider to be the most uh, fatigue, pain, shortness of breath, depression, and anxiety. And you might think that well, maybe there's more substantive decline afterwards. Uh, perhaps there are more the symptoms that were of greatest problems. Perhaps it's a great opportunity to climb in an intermediate group here with conditions such as urinary problems, uh, such as swelling and feet and ankles. And the results aren't quite as pronounced. And then we have two conditions that we think the hospital will going to do much about cold or flu symptoms or, or poor uh, high eyesight. And just see pretty much just flat uh, So, to summarize, the burden of restricting symptoms increases progressively several months before the start of hospice peaks around the time of hospice admission and decreases substantially after the start of hospice. Uh, the median duration of hospice is unfortunately very short. Uh, so one can argue that earlier referral to hospice may help to alleviate the burden of symptoms uh, or those that are distressing uh, at the end of life. Um, and we're thinking about other opportunities. This is a cohort that can Age, the average age is 88 now. Um, we're hoping to follow that for another five years. Uh, as of the end of January, there were 643 decedents. Um, and you know, in five more years, the youngest participant will be about 91. This age distribution is very similar to the Hispanic Epis because Hispanic Epis started in 1993 at age um, 93 at age 65 and We started in 98 at age 70. Uh, here's kind of the some cast of characters, uh, part of the PEP team, not all working at any one time. We only have a small subset of these folks now uh, as the cohort's been diminished. We have an outstanding field staff, project coordinator, system programmer, data management team, biostatisticians, and an increasing number of junior faculty and, and trainees who have used these data uh, for a variety of other types of I want to thank you for your attention, and I welcome the opportunity to answer any questions.
UTMB Health, working together to work wonders.